Hey everyone, welcome to Lake Okeechobee 101. We're just gonna wait a minute for everyone to get in here and then we will get started. So you can't see my, my uh, cursor moving, can you? Nope, you're all good, Paul. Okay. <clears throat> everyone, we're just waiting for everyone to, to log into the webinar and we will get started in just a few minutes. Are you muted? I am muted. Thanks, Paul. Um, everyone in the webinar, we're, uh, we're just waiting for everyone to come in. Our participant numbers are still climbing. So just give us another minute or two, and then we will get started with Lake Okeechobee 101. And that's the Everglades snail kite on, on the front panel. We already had that question. <clears throat> All right, everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Erica Zambello, and I'm the Communications Director for Audubon, Florida. And I want to welcome you all to Lake Okeechobee 101 with Dr. Paul Gray, our Everglades Science Coordinator. So thank you guys all for, for being here today. We're really excited to have you. I'm just gonna go over some really quick housekeeping things. Uh, you might've noticed already, but you come into the webinar on mute. And uh, we're not doing a participant audio today just because there's so many of you uh, wonderful people coming in. If you do wanna ask a question, you can use the chat function on your screen. It looks like this little chat blurb or bubble right here. You can just click it and type in your question anytime during the webinar and we will have a question and answer period at the end. We are going to try our best to get to everyone's question and that includes people who are tuning in to the Facebook Live on uh, the National Audubon Society's Facebook page. So you can also chat your question there. So a recording of the webinar will be made available online if you registered, uh, that will come in the next day or so. And if you are interested in tuning in on Facebook, the video of this webinar will live on the National Audubon Society's Facebook page under the video tab. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Gray and we will get started. All right, thank you, Erica. Um, okay, well, hi everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm Paul Gray. I, I work, I'm a staff scientist uh, working in the Everglades program for Audubon. Um, I've been in Florida about a little bit more than 30 years and the last 25 years have been with Audubon. And I came here to work, I'm from the Midwest, I'm from Missouri, near Kansas City, and I came here to work on ducks and work on Lake Okeechobee, and um, I'm still here. And I think the reason I'm still here is because I'm so enchanted with Okeechobee. It's this huge, strange lake, it's subtropical and has all kinds of birds and life and everything like that. And um, we have an Audubon airboat, we take people out of the lake and, and um, go around and, and look at stuff. And when we get back to the boat ramp, the most common comment we get is holy cow I didn't know the lake was like that and I think that's why I still like going out I mean no matter what time of year or what lake level you're at it's just there's always something there so what we'll do today is I'll talk about Lake Okeechobee what it's like 
Um, most people only hear about Lake Okeechobee when it has big problems like algae blooms and it's dumping water on the estuaries and they're all getting harmed or the water's low and we're in a drought and we're fighting with, for water, fighting over water with farmers and all that kind of stuff. It's all the bad stuff, but there's a lot of good stuff about the lake too. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, we'll get going. Uh, my office is right there in Highlands County, um, right in the middle of the Okeechobee watershed, uh, out in the country in the middle of Florida. Next. Okay, so most of you don't know me, so I put in this picture of me in 1938. <laughs> and my name is Marvin Chandler, and I'm the very first Audubon warden on Lake Okeechobee. Uh, Marvin was hired in 1936, and so this is the 84th year of our program. And notice he has two belt buckles. The one on the left is actually a badge, and that was back when our state wildlife agency didn't have a very big um, law enforcement unit. And so Audubon would hire people and the state and feds would deputize him and, and he carried a badge and a gun and he was the game warden on Lake Okeechobee. And uh, the reason he's holding this snake, that's a water moccasin. The thing's five feet, 11 inches long. And they were out filming glossy ibises on Lake Okeechobee in the 1930s, because back then, 95% of all the glossy ibises nesting in North America were nesting on Lake Okeechobee. And so Marvin, one of his big focuses was protecting that colony because there were only about 1,500 of them. And they couldn't get around the snake on the trail when they were coming out of the lake, and so they ended up killing it. Um, and if you look at how fat it is, they opened it up, and in its stomach, it had a glossy ibis egg, it had three tricolored heron eggs, it had another egg that was digested, it had a baby American egret and an adult glossy ibis. So if you find water moccasins, they're fun to play with. Um, next. And this is real typical in Central Florida now. This is, you know, we have a lot of grasslands on the interior. It's very rural and glossy ibises are everywhere now and people don't even really realize there's a, already a conservation success in that. So next. And in 1938, to give us some support, the governor and cabinet designated two areas of Lake Okeechobee as wildlife sanctuaries. And that kind of gave Marvin some extra authority in, in enforcing game laws out there. Um, he was followed by two of his nephews and his great nephew. And so up until 1992, people of the Chandler family were working for Audubon. And when I first came here, I was kind of scared being an environmentalist out in the country, among, you know, but everybody liked Audubon. I didn't really know the Chandler memory and they were one of the founding members of the community. So everybody liked me and I was like, oh, great. But it's due to the Chandlers and, and them being part of the community. And so it's, it's really fun to work here and, and be here. Next. Okay, the other reason I'm still here is I love my coworkers. <laughs> and on the left is Celeste. Uh, she's the director of our Everglades program. And on the right is Doug. And I can talk about them because they're on mute right now. Um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, Celeste is young enough to be my daughter, but she's very wise and smart. And it's just really fun to work for her. And Doug is an attorney and he could do other stuff, but he wants to do this work too. So, um, and this is taken in Okeechobee. We're out on one of our airboat trips. And this is one was with the Corps of Engineers where we go out and look at the lake and people came down from Jacksonville and over from, from, Fort, uh, from West Palm Beach to, to see the lake. And, and conversations about Lake Okeechobee are just a million times better when you're actually out on the water. So next. So if you look at where Okeechobee sits in the Everglades watershed, on the left is kind of a conceptual view of the watershed. And if you've ever landed at the Orlando International Airport, you essentially landed right at the headwaters of the Everglades. And a drop of water that lands there goes through the Kissimmee chain of lakes. It goes down the Kissimmee River into Lake Okeechobee. And the important thing about Okeechobee is all the water north of it went into it. And then it all flowed out and almost all of it went to the Everglades, but some of it went over to the Caloosahatchee River on the west, that, that river sticking up toward the lake, but none of it went to the east coast. And that hourglass effect of Lake Okeechobee and its large size makes it kind of the single most important water management feature in South Florida because it's kind of right in the middle and it's a pivot point. So just bear that in mind as we talk about the things that are going on with the lake. Next. And it's big. Um, it's about 30 to 35 miles across, depending on which way you go. This is from the air and you can't see the other side. Um, if you take a boat out to the middle of it, you can't see shore in any direction. And it's shallow. When you're out there in a boat and you can't see shore, it's only like 10 feet deep. So it's really a big saucer lake. Next. 
And people think of the middle of the lake as kind of, you know, just a big wasteland. But actually, uh, when we started flying surveys, when I worked for FWC, uh, we found out there's thousands of, ten, hundreds of thousands of lesser scop out in the middle of the lake. Uh, those boats down on the bottom, those are commercial fishing boats. And the little boats on the left are, are tender boats. They carry nets. And, um, and they go out and they have little purse things, and they're a thousand yards long and they pull them up and they catch catfish and bluegill and they sell them commercially. Next. And so one of the big sport fish in the lake is, is the black crappie. Uh, they call them speckled perch down here. Uh, when the lake is working well, you can catch as many as a million crappie out of Lake Okeechobee in one year. Um, that's probably more than the entire rest of the state put together. Um, the other big fishery is the bass fishery. And in the FLW bass tournament in 2012, I think, um, and that's the Fred Wood, the Ranger bass boat guy, this big tournament, and they all wear all the endorsement stickers. They look like race car drivers and stuff. Um, and the three heaviest stringers were the heaviest in the history of the tournament. So the guy in third place had the heaviest history ever, had the heaviest stringer ever, and he was in third place. And he was like, I just can't believe it. But that's what this lake can be. Next. And some of these guys are really enthusiastic about fishing. <laughs> Next. <laughs> okay, so the lake's so big, it influences its weather. And look at that little bar in the middle. That's how much rain we expect to get in these weather forecasts. And notice the orange down there in the bottom is, is low rain, and then the blues and the greens are, are higher rain. And look at the, the map on the right. See that? See how there's not rain right above Lake Okeechobee? And the map on the left, the wind's blowing to the north, and there's, a, there's not rain on the lake, and there's a rain shadow behind it. So why does that happen? Next. Well, this is a picture in the summer. And what happens in the summertime is when the sun comes up, June, July, August, September, it heats up the land, and the air gets hot, and it starts rising. And since we live on the ocean, with well, oceans on both sides, it's really moist air. And as it rises, it starts making thunderclouds. But when it shines down Lake Okeechobee, the lake is circulating water and it doesn't heat up as fast. And so it doesn't have thunderclouds build up above it. And so it creates rain shadows. And so Lake Okeechobee actually is influencing the weather around it and it gets significantly less rain on it. Um, and this is, this is an important thing. You know, everybody up north, you're used to winter and summer. Our seasons really are the wet season and the dry season. And so we get about two thirds of our rain in the summer and everything fills up with water during the summer. And then from about November or October until the next May, it's dry. So we have a really long dry season, a really punctuated rainy season, and that really influences our hydrology. We'll get into more of that later. Next. Okay, so if you look at the, the lake real closely here, um, now we're gonna get into some of the problems and, and I'll talk about them and as you listen to some of the things that are going on, you're just going to think, holy moly, this is really terrible. But um, stick around till the end. We can fix this. We know how to do it and we're trying to, but, but we've kind of gotten ourselves into trouble. So this is cyanobacteria in the lake. Um, that's the kind of algae, what's well, really a bacteria, um, that produce toxins. And so when it gets in the lake water, it's a threat to human health. It's a threat to wildlife. You can see the, the St. Lucie Canal going out to the upper right, just to the south of that reservoir. Um, and it goes to the coast, and, and if you open the gate, not only do they get too much fresh water, um, it's got this bad stuff in it. So that's really something that we don't like having. Next. And so here is two years later in 2018. We don't get cyanobacteria blooms every year. We don't get them most years, but when we get them, they could be really bad. And if you look at that lower left panel where the lake's just bright yellow and red, you know, that was really a bad outbreak. And it's covering like 300 square miles. It's, it's just huge and horrible. And that panel, the most colorful one, was in July. And I'm going to show you a photo back in the marshes in, during the same month coming up next. Next. This is about two miles from the open water of the lake. And we're back in the marsh, obviously. And look at the water clarity here. And that's periphyton. And periphyton is growing on the bottom. And it's kind of the scuzzy little algal community that actually really cleans the water. And, and you can drink this water. Um, it's just, uh, it's amazingly clean. Next. And so <laughs> here's these guys going, what's going on, you know? And that's kind of the thing about Okeechobee is that even when bad things are happening, we're having algae blooms. We also have beautiful parts of the lake that are being fed by rainfall and being cleaned by plants and there's birds and fish and, and an abundance of life. And so, you know, this is the kind of stuff that keeps me going is that we've got problems, but not everything's bad. And 
even when things are bad, a lot of times things, some things are really good. So next. And by the way, when I take people back there, I'd actually drink the water and it'd freak them out, but it's just to show them, you know, it's not all bad. And so if you go upstream of the lake um, to the watershed, this is the Kissimmee Prairie. This is native cover. Um, that kind of gray area or big wetland sloughs and, and the green area or palmettos. And so the watershed's really, really flat. And so when I talked about the summer, when our rainy season, at the end of the summer, when you go out to this place, you're in, in ankle deep water everywhere you go. The whole place is wet. And historically, the watershed would fill up during the summer. Uh, and then for the next, the long dry season we have, seven or eight months, it would, it would slowly drain down to Lake Okeechobee. And by the time June came um, and rain started again, it would be mostly dry, be about in this condition. So that's how a watershed used to function. Next. And part of the reason Audubon's here is we have five endemic prairie birds. This area gets a whole lot of lightning strikes and, and um, we think it probably naturally burned every two, two years or three years. And so these are all subspecies of birds that stay here in Florida their whole life. They never leave the state, they breed here. Um, and they're all subspecies that are related to other subspecies, but, but they're geographically uh, separated from them. And we have sandhill cranes and grasshopper sparrows migrate down here, um, but then they migrate back north and, and those two subspecies, they're together, but not, not during the breeding season. So these are all kind of special birds that, that Audubon is here for. Next. And up in the watershed, there's some really pretty lakes. This is Lake Estapoga, there's Lakes Kissimmee, these big lakes and, and river systems. So it's this big flat area of prairies and lakes and rivers and it's just, it's just wonderful. Next. And so back to Lake Okeechobee. Um, that little dot way out there in the middle of the picture is, is actually a snail kite. And again, you know, people think about Okeechobee having problems, but you look at this and this part of it at this time is just gorgeous. Next. Okay, so kind of some of the weird stuff. Um, most people know that's a great blue heron. And what's it, what's it carrying? That's not a snake, it's a salamander. Notice the, the arm that's sticking on the, on the heron's uh, neck. So this is called an amphiuma, it's an aquatic salamander. Um, there's, there's a few kinds of them down here and they're really big and they've got those feathery gills. And you know, these are just some of the things that, that live in these southern, um, subtropical wetlands. Next. And you almost never see them, but the birds can seem to be able to find them. Um, this is an Okeechobee gourd. It's an endemic uh, gourd in South Florida. It's endangered. Um, it's real similar to some gourds in, in Mexico, and so we think maybe the Indians traded it around the Gulf Rim. Um, the seeds are pretty good to eat, pretty good food, but people are interested in this gourd because of its leaves. Um, they don't seem to get leaf rot and some other diseases. If you think about pumpkins and gourds and squashes, you know, humans eat a lot of those. And if these guys have genetics and, and tricks to resist crop diseases, if we could splice their genes into our commercial stuff, maybe we could um, make, you know, better crops for humans. So that's, that's one of those strange things about biodiversity and this, this kind of strange little plant. So next. Okay, so does everybody know what this is? <laughs> this is a swallowtail kite. I'm going to take a little bit of a diversion from Lake Okeechobee and the Everglades to talk a little bit about birds, because after all, we are Audubon. Um, and so uh, we're going to talk about swallowtail kites for a minute. Next. Those are all swallowtail kites. And these are really big birds. Their wingspan's about, you know, I don't know, four feet, five feet. Next. And if you look out at, at these trees, you notice there's things in the trees. Next. <laughs> so this is in Fish Eating Creek. This is right next to Lake Okeechobee. And in the summer, late summer, swallowtail kites are migrating back to South America. And this one spot has about half of all swallowtail kites in North America get in this one spot. And what they're trying to do is get fat before they fly across the ocean to go back to South America. And swallowtail kites are just glorious flyers, but they soar on, on, on thermals. And of course, as we talked about with Lake Okeechobee, you don't get thermals above water. So when they fly across the Gulf of Mexico, they're flapping and they don't really have the soaring thermals. So not only it's a long flight, but they have to really get fat. And birds are different from us. They can burn their fat while they exercise. We'll die with fat on us, but birds can burn it while they go. 
And so these guys are trying to get fat. And so, you know, as a conservationist, I'm sitting here going, man, we've got to get them fat. We've got to get them on their way. And if we don't, we've failed North America because this is half of all of them. So not only do we have to protect this roost, but we got to make sure we have a good food supply down here, which, which largely is a lot of aerial bugs, to make sure these guys can carry on their way. Next. And so these are some satellite tracks from Ken Myers Group, the Avian Research Conservation Institute. Their, their logo is down there in the lower right. And if you get on their website, these maps are all available. And so these are some birds uh, leaving Florida, flying across the Gulf of Mexico and, and um, being on their way. And now we're going to look at some of them coming back. Next. Oh, wait, nope, <laughs> this one was going south. Okay, so, so this bird took off from Florida. And, you know, you don't think it's very far to get to Cuba. Uh, if things go bad, you can dump down in there. But notice it got caught in headwinds and it blew it all the way across the Gulf of Mexico. And three days later, it landed in Texas further north and it took off. So one of the problems of flying across the ocean is not only it's a long way, but you have to have enough fat on you that if things don't go right, you can still make it to shore. Next. And here's one of those birds coming back. The bird's name is Mia, which is short for Miami, where they banded it. And it was trying to get to Florida. And you notice it took off March 1st, landed in Cuba on March 4th. So it was in the air for three days. It got caught in headwinds. It finally had to ditch in Cuba. And it, it probably you know, took a lot of huffs and puffs. And then it took back off from Cuba. And look where it got blown to, Louisiana. And, <laughs> and that was another three-day flight. And then it made its way over to the Tallahassee area and then took off across the ocean again and finally made it back to Cuba. This is just an illustration of you know, not only it's hard, but it's like really hard for these guys to, to make it. Next. And then this one, um, it took off, and this is not a good story. Um, it, it, it got caught in headwinds and it looped back and it got so close to the Yucatan, but it didn't go back in and land. And um, it, it then, its radio signal disappeared. And um, Ken thinks these guys can last about four days in the air, um, which is a pretty Herculean thing to be flying for four days straight. And, but if it gets worse than that, that and on the way back is one of their worst times. So it just goes to show that when they get here, we've got to really do our best to make them fat and happy when they leave. Next. And so these are red knots. Um, they, are, they are some of the longest distant migrants um, and they fly from Argentina all the way to the Arctic Circle. Um, and when they're down there, they actually put on so much weight, they double their body weight. And while they're doing it, they, they, their, their intestines get big, their liver gets big, their uh, kidneys get big because they're processing all this food to make them really, really fat. And a couple of days before they leave, they stop eating and they reabsorb those, those protein tissues and they add them to their muscles. And then when they take off, they are basically a great big flying muscle and, and a tank of gas, which is called fat. And they fly, these guys can fly for, for more days than kites. They can go five, six, seven days. And you wonder, you know, how can you go seven days exercising, but how do you not sleep? And, and we're not completely sure how everybody does it, um, but mallards can actually sleep with one hemisphere of their brain while the other one stays alert. And frigate birds, they put electrodes in them and they can kind of take power naps while they're soaring. So we, you know, we can't fly for seven days with these guys, so I'm not sure how they do it, but, but they have some mechanism. And how do you go for seven days without drinking water? Well, when they're metabolizing their fat, they actually can, can it makes some water. And so um, they do physiological feats like, you know, we know about athletes taking steroids, but we're just, that's child's play compared to what birds can do to their, their physiology. And again, it just really puts the onus on us to make sure that we feed them well when they're in our neighborhoods. Next. And so all these little beauties were banded on Lake Okeechobee. Um, they were headed south. And um, they also fly across the ocean. They double their body weight. They only weigh as much as about two nickels. And when they leave, they weigh as much as four nickels. And so, you know, most of them are looking for bugs because they're, they're warblers. Next. These guys were banded out there too. Um, and Tyler, this is from Tyler Beck from, he's with FWC. And he actually had two birds that came back to the island the next year in the same month. And they're kind of like us. They remember where they've been. And if you've been to a town and you know where a good restaurant is, when you go back to that town, you go back to the restaurant. Well, the birds do that too. And so it's important for us to keep good habitat every year because if they come back and everything's been wrecked and they don't find food, then, then that's not good for them. So again, it just, we're all in this together. So next. 
And so if you look at Florida Peninsula, you know, not everybody comes through Florida for sure, but, but we have this kind of disproportionate responsibility for birds because we're, when they get here, we're the last gas station before they leave. And when they're coming back, we're the first gas station when they arrive. And so acre for acre, you know, I just think we have more pressure on us to make sure we maintain bird habitat. And so, you know, I tell people when we're trying to restore the Everglades, we're trying to save our birds and, and make the Everglades good and save our endemic prairie birds. But we're also trying to take care of birds from, from North and South America that are coming and going and have great needs and great jobs to do. Next. And, you know, we like birds because they're pretty and they sing and all that kind of stuff. But, but there's a practical reason. There are some guys in Missouri that put some tents over trees out in the forest and the, the trees broke out with caterpillar outbreaks and bugs and they actually lost 25% of their leaves. And the trees in the forest next to them were only having 13% leaf loss because the birds were cleaning bugs off them. And it actually significantly slowed the growth of those trees. So, you know, if you're a forester in Pennsylvania or a forester in Nova Scotia, you may not know it, but it really matters to you if these birds come back. And in that sense, you know, it really matters to you if we restore the Everglades. Um, so this is, um, this is kind of a utilitarian argument, but, but it matters. Next. And without going into great amount of detail, you know, there's all kinds of things birds do for pollinating and spreading seeds around and making cavities that lizards and frogs and other birds live in and stuff like that. So birds are not just pretty, but they're important. Next. And it turns out there's lots of things migrating. Butterflies, we, everybody knows monarchs migrate, but it, now we're learning that there's a whole lot of butterflies that migrate, dragonflies migrate, bees migrate. So um, again, we're trading in all kinds of animals coming from here and there and let's do a good job. Next. So anyway, back to Okeechobee, that's my little bird spiel. All right, so we'll go back and we'll talk about Okeechobee. We're gonna talk about some of the problems we've had and then we'll wrap up with uh, the things we need to do to fix it. Next. Okay, so back to the, here's the good old days before we all got here and started mucking around. And so the water flowed all the way from Orlando down into Okeechobee. And then all that water went into the Everglades. A little bit of it went over to the Caloosahatchee on the west. None of it went to the St. Lucie on the east. Next. And this is a grave marker on the east side of Okeechobee. And it reads to the 1600 pioneers in this mass burial who gave their lives in the 1928 hurricane. Um, that hurricane blew a 12 foot storm surge out of Okeechobee over the town of Belglade. And it killed probably half the people in town. We, we think maybe 3000, but there's not even a record because it was just such carnage. And so the stories are just horrifying. And two years earlier in, in the town of Moorhaven, the same thing happened and it, it blew over that town and killed about 500 people. And then um, in the 1940s, we had some really big wet hurricane years and it flooded everything essentially from Miami to Orlando. And so the state of Florida went to the Corps of Engineers and said, can you help us drain this state? This is just out of control. We can't live here. We can't have cities and farms if, if this stuff is like this. And so the Corps said, yes, next. And so what they did was they took the historic flow, which is that left, that, that left graphic and being engineers, they're pretty smart. They said, well, you know, if we're trying to run Okeechobee water from Okeechobee down to Florida Bay, it's 100 miles, and it's only a 20, the lake was only 20 feet high at that time. So imagine a 20 foot gradient over 100 miles. You just have no, <laughs> they said, well, let's dig, a, let's dig big drainage canals east and west. And when we get into trouble, we'll just run the water down the St. Lucie and Caloosahatchee. And they did that. But now what's happening is they get too much water because they're these little bitty estuaries that got hooked up to this great big, watershed and lake and now the Everglades doesn't get enough water and it's too dried out and so Everglades restoration is going to try to reverse this by sending the water back to the Everglades where it's needed and quit dumping it in the estuaries and also try to smooth out Lake Okeechobee's water levels too. Next. So here's a couple maps of you know modern Florida and the one on the left is actually the the project that they built all those canals and if you could look in detail, there's all kinds of structures and gates and pumps. And it's really a very complicated. And actually, they did a lot of smart things in that. But, but they designed it in the 1940s. And if you think about, we haven't really submit, substantially upgraded it since the 1940s. And, and it's kind of like if you had a car from the 1940s, how would you do today? And the answer is you'd get by. You know, I don't know if you'd keep up on the freeway and you wouldn't have any air conditioning. And 
you'd have an AM radio and your tires would go flat all the time, but, but you could do it. And that's kind of what we do with this water management system. It's, it's, it's outdated. And so um, the problem I'm going to describe to you, I'm going to go through what happened during Hurricane Irma and you'll, and you'll see some limitations. But on the right is this kind of a GIS map and you can see all the human activity. That red area is the Everglades agricultural area. Um, and uh, we've just changed the peninsula a lot. And so how do we protect the things that are valuable and, and good about Florida while having people live here? Next. So here's one of the changes, uh, farmland. Uh, when it rains on this farmland, remember I just said, you know, in the summer it'd rain and everything would flood. Well, you can't let that happen here or it'd kill the crops. And so when the water lands here, they have to send it somewhere, somewhere other than where they are. Next. Here's a neighborhood on the Lower East Coast, same deal. You know, when the water lands here, you can't leave it there. It's going to flood people's homes. And so they have to send it somewhere. They, they got to get drainage. Next. Okay, so this was a bad night for a lot of us Floridians, or bad couple nights. Um, but I'm going to talk about what happened after Hurricane Irma. And, and remember, I'm going to be talking about a hurricane, so it's not a normal year in Florida. And the impacts from Irma are a lot more severe than what normally happens. But when you look at extreme weather events, they kind of show you the limitations of your water management system. So we're going to kind of take it from the northern part of the watershed. We're going to start in Orlando, and we're going to follow the progression of water impacts as, as it moves south. Next. OK, so here's water levels in Lake Okeechobee. And the scale on the left is, is how many feet deep it is. And you notice the lake went down to 11 feet at one point, and then it went all the way up to 17. And that very sharp spike that happened in September, where it went from below 14 up to 17, that was, that was Irma and the rainfall that came after it. And so the lake just jumped three feet. And by the way, um, those red lines are the, the range we'd like to keep the lake for its health. And notice we're above it, then we're below it, then we're above it. And so we're going to talk a little bit about why it, it jumps so erratically, <laughs> which, which wasn't good. You know, we lost a whole bunch of vegetation. I'll get to that. Next. Okay, so first, there's something really cool here. This is a graph the Water Management District made and is color coded. So see the green dot on the left side of Lake Okeechobee, uh, S131? That green line on this graph is the water level at, at that green dot. And look at the purple dot on the right side, S352. That purple line is the purple dot. And this was when Irma came in, and this was around midnight, I think. But notice that at the same time that the lake was 20 feet high, on the green side, it was below 10 feet on the purple side. That's the wind sash. That's, that's the storm surge that went over Bell Glade. And so this lake just has really a lot of water. And so people are kind of upset we built the Hoover Dyke around the lake. It completely encircles it. But, you know, this didn't flood out and kill anybody. So, you know, there's unintended consequences with stuff, but, but there's reasons for it too. So next. And this is the lake after the storm went by. Um, there's a lot of piled up vegetation because the wind blew across the lake and those waves were really <laughs> tearing up vegetation. But the, the slide on the right really has, see that muddy color? Um, that's, that's, the lake has developed a mud bottom. We think when the hurricanes used to blow all that water out of the lake, it also blew a lot of mud out of the lake. But now we have a dike around it and it can't do that. So the lake's been accumulating mud recently. And after the storm, the lake was just really, really muddy. I mean, it looked like the Missouri River that I grew up next to. And the S191, that's the inflow water coming from the watershed. You see how different characteristics. So the hurricane had an immediate direct impact on the lake. Next. And so now we're up near Orlando. And the first thing you look at, and this is after the storm, is who gave a permit to put all those houses in this spot? But anyway, be that as it may, um, obviously the agencies can't let this stay because this is really terrible for these people. And so when you get these fast, these really quick rain events and you have a really flat spot, water tends to accumulate and there's a very big need to drain this water out of here as fast as you can. And so that's what the, the project does and, and we have to get relief to these people. Next. And so that that little city was right there at the top of the green area, right at the top of your watershed, and that's the upper Kissimmee. 
and that whole green area is about a million acres and Lake Kissimmee is right in the bottom middle of it and all the water goes through Lake Kissimmee. So we're going to look at the water graph of Lake Kissimmee and we're going to remember that's 40 percent of the watershed of Lake Okeechobee uh, is being drained through Lake Kissimmee. Next. So here's the hydrograph for Lake Kissimmee and you can see September and all of a sudden it went from 52 to 54. Boom. Well that was Irma coming in. But look at the other side of that graph. It went from 54 back to 52 by the end of October. So Irma hit like September 10th or 11th. And by the end of October, they had drained the water out of the Kissimmee Valley. 40% of the watershed was drained. And if you look at Lake Kissimmee, we try to keep it following that red line. And as of November, you know, they were way below the red line and they were in a drought. Um, and you think about getting all that rain and you're in a drought so fast. And that's what drainage does is when you drain your water away, then it's gone. And as soon as the dry season starts, you, you're in a drought. But that water had to go somewhere. And that's why the Okeechobee peaked so rapidly is because we had built such an efficient drainage system. We can get, you know, I talked about the watershed being flat and filling up with water and draining out over six months. Now we can do it all in one month and it slaps all that water in the lake in a big hurry, makes the lake really, really deep and starts a cascade of bad events downstream. Next. And this is the, <laughs> I'm sorry, the river floodplain is disembodied, but this is the Kissimmee River floodplain. It's about two or three miles wide, and this is probably about a 15 or 20 mile stretch. Um, and this was, I want you to look at that, that floodplain map on the right side that has the current uh, level on January 7th, uh, 2018. So the, the oranges and, and the browns are dry. And so here the river, we just had this major hurricane and the river floodplain is in a drought just a couple months later. Um, what we, and we're doing a Kissimmee River restoration project. We're going to try to keep this wet in the future, but, but that's kind of the, the flip side of drainage is, is once the water's gone, then, then it really makes you vulnerable to droughts. Next. And meanwhile, down in Lake Okeechobee, um, this is the, the blue line is the only one you need to look at. Forget all those other squiggles. Those are other fun years. Um, but, but the lake only went down to about 13 feet because when it gets up to 17, we just can't get that much water out of the lake before the next hurricane season. And then we got a little bit of rain starting the, the wet season and, and the core had to start dumping. Because when Irma was coming in, I had a reporter call me and, and said, you know, are, is the dike going to break? Is this going to, you know, kill people? And I'm like, no, you know, we're only about 14 feet. And we have about three feet of freeboard. So, you know, 17, we don't, they don't really want to go above 17. And so, you know, we should be fine unless it's an unusual hurricane. Well, Irma comes in, the lake goes right to 17. And, and she calls me back. Well, it took about a month, but it, it did it. And she calls me back and she said, well, what if we get a storm now? And that's the problem is when it rains and the, the drainage in the upper watershed fills the lake up, it fills it more quickly than we can lower the lake. And so for the Corps of Engineers who's responsible for protecting the dike, their fear isn't what the lake level is today, it's what's it gonna be after the next big storm. And so when Irma came in, we were, we were ready for it, but if another storm had come in, that would have been a problem. And so that's part of what Everglades Restoration is gonna to try to do is we're gonna to try to catch this water somewhere besides Lake Okeechobee to try to take the pressure off the lake. Um, and, and, you know, because it's, it's, it's a little bit of a dangerous situation and the Corps is working right now to reinforce the dike, but such a big long dike, you can never make it completely safe. So, you know, part of this is just trying to get our water under control. Next. And so this is the St. Lucie estuary and the map up there on the upper left-hand side, you know, shows where the estuary is. It's, it's the city of Stewart. And these are flows into the estuary and this is flows associated with Irma. And if you look down there on the bottom, um, all those flows are a combination of, of <clears throat> other, other things, but basically the blue is, is Lake Okeechobee. And the St. Lucie estuary, you never want to get more than 2,000. Um, you get more than 2,000 CFS, you start getting too much freshness and not enough salinity. And if you look before Irma came in, you notice there's a bunch of peaks and valleys in there. And so that's their, that's their watershed draining into them. And you notice we go above 2,000, but that's okay because it doesn't last long. It's just a local rainstorm. The water runs off. It gets fresh. If you're an oyster, you just close your shell and wait a couple days, and then the salt water comes back and you're fine. But notice when Okeechobee started in October, it just kept pumping and pumping and pumping all the way to January. And if you're an oyster sitting there and you're in this period from, you know, basically from September to, to January, 
where you're up to 4,000, you never get a break and you can't last that long. And so they tend to lose their seagrasses and their oysters and fish evacuate. It's just, it's horrible for them because that's just way too much water for such a small estuary. And remember, it was never their water anyway. And so they're um, very upset about this, obviously, but the core has to do it when the lakes are 17 feet and they're nervous about another storm coming in. They, you know, they don't have time to be environmentalists. And this is the pickle we're in. And this is part of the reason why we're trying to build new infrastructure. Next. And here's the same story on the other coast, the Caloosahatchee. Notice they have spikes going up and down um, before the storm. But once the storm hits, then they're way up there. Um, and Okeechobee's contributions are relentless. And again, it's that duration thing that if it goes on for three months, things can hang on for a while, but they can't hang on forever. So this is a pattern that we want to get out of um, in the future. Next. And if you go south of Lake Okeechobee, where that red star is down in the Everglades, um, they also got too deep and they've got some of their own problems. You know, when the rain falls in the cities, some of it gets sent to the ocean, some of it gets sent to the Everglades. And you think about the Everglades, they already had their rainstorm and they get water drained into them just like Okeechobee did. You know, it got its own hurricane, but it had all that water dumped from the whole watershed into it. Well, the Everglades has the same problem. So it gets too deep too from all of the human drainage. Next. And here's deer running along a levee. Um, they don't normally run around looking like wildebeest, but you know, there's just no dry area for them. And so drainage has two problems. One is it makes our wet areas even wetter because of, you know, we take all our human water and we throw it into natural systems. And then when the rain stops, we get into a drought. Next. And back on Okeechobee, um, there used to be vegetation between this shoreline and that far tree island, um, it's all gone, the deep water. Once it gets that deep, those plants don't have enough sunlight and the water's too deep on them and, and they start dying. So again, uh, don't get spare. Well, we'll talk, but we'll get to how we're gonna fix this in a minute. <laughs> anyway, next. And uh, <laughs> when that stuff blows in, it looks kind of smooth and flat, but this guy in his airboat it's actually really lumpy and, and I learned real fast, don't get into that stuff. And this poor guy went in and he went over a hump and when his bow went down, it went underneath the next hump and it just lodged in there. And you notice he was only a hundred feet from shore, um, but it took him a month to get that out of there. They had to take heavy equipment out there because that wet stuff is so compacted and so heavy that they couldn't dig it out. But anyway, he did get his airboat back and he was okay. But um, anyway, just a Okeechobee story, next. Okay, and so one of the other things that happens in the lake, uh, that black crappie fisher I talked about, where we can catch a million. This is after the 2004 and 5 hurricanes. Notice how they just tanked and they didn't recover for years. So not only it's bad the year it happens, but when you lose plants, when the water gets all stirred up and, and all that, you know, it, it has long lasting effects. So for a future of Florida, you know, we, we want to get out of these patterns and get into a, a more benign pattern when things are going to be better more often. Next. Okay, so one more disaster slide um, <laughs> with water levels. This is 2005 to seven. And the big peak there on the left is Hurricane Irma. And notice the lake went up to 17 feet again. And again, we don't really want it to get above 15. But the thing to really notice about this is in the spring of 2006, the, the year after Irma hit, we were dumping the water. The Corps is trying to get the water out because they have to get the lake low so they'll be ready for the next hurricane season. And they have enough freeboard. Um, but notice that summer, the lake dropped below that black dotted line and it ended up going all the way down to nine feet. That black dotted line is the water rationing line. And that's the level where we go below that, we tell all the farmers who rely on the lake for irrigation water, we're cutting you back 50%, actually 45%, but whatever. Um, and the weird thing about this is the two years before that year, we dumped enough water to meet all their water needs for six years, six years, and we dumped it. And as soon as we got into that drought, they were getting cut back. And so this system doesn't work for human water supply either. It's not working for the farmers. It's not working for the cities. It's not working for the health of Okeechobee. And, and so when you talk about Everglades restoration in South Florida, everybody supports it. The farmers want better service. The cities want better service. The communities want better service. The environmentalists want better service. And, 
and Republicans and Democrats agree on this. This is just something that, you know, we just have this antiquated system and, you know, we've got to get rid of this 1940s. Well, we got to upgrade this, upgrade the system. It's 70 years old. It's time for us to do this. Everybody agrees on it. The problem is it's very expensive. It takes a long time, but you know, if we don't do this, our future, you know, is going to be these kind of hilarious calamities. So anyway, so we'll get to, first we're going to talk about nutrients and then we'll get to what do we do next. Oh, and by the way, um, we still have 50% of the wetlands Everglades left, but we only have about 10% of the birds. And the reason is as our wetlands go up and down too fast, the fish populations can't keep up, the plant populations can't keep up, and, and, and so it really hurts the birds. So part of, if we can build the Everglades infrastructure and smooth all this out, we should get back up to 50% of our birds. So um, it's just one of those things that at first people were scratching their heads going, well, we have half the wetlands, why not half the birds? Well, you look at all these hydrology problems and you're like, oh, okay. So next. And by the way, that's the snowy egret, which was the most prized bird of the plume hunters. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about nutrient pollution and, and the cyanobacteria. Um, and so the phosphorus goal for Lake Okeechobee is about 40 parts per billion. And if you look, um, Back in the 1970s, it was about that. That was, you know, kind of the pristine levels. And of course, we were doing more and more intense agriculture and, um, and fertilizing and stuff like that. So the green dots are the average inflow concentration in Lake Okeechobee. You notice they've been, you know, between 150 and 200 or so uh, for decades. And as they've continued to be high, the lake's phosphorus condition has been getting higher and higher and higher and kind of equalizing with, with the thing. And the reason 40 was set as our goal is because back when we had 40 parts per billion phosphorus in the lake, we didn't have cyanobacteria. And so once we got above 50, we started getting more and more cyanobacteria. And as long as we stay up in these high ranges, 100 to 200, we're going to be vulnerable to cyanobacteria. So we'd like to get that back down to 40. Next. And when you have a polluted water body, uh, everybody goes around saying, okay, who did it? And let's go hang them. Um, and I just want to illustrate something here that um, if you look at the phosphorus budgets in the upper chain of lakes, notice that top pie chart, most of the phosphorus import is urban, like 60%. And that's because of the Orlando Metroplex. You know, it expands down into the upper part of that watershed. And so most of the people bringing in phosphorus are in the cities. You go to the southern part, down where it says northern Lake Okeechobee, they change the color on the thing, but notice the urban slices only it's that yellow one, it's only 8% or 9%. And so, because that's, it's a more agricultural area. So a lot of times people say, well, you know, who's to blame? And I just, I want to put this slide up. The answer is it's all of us, whether you live in the city, whether you live in the country, um, we all contribute to drainage and we all contribute to nutrients. And so, you know, let's not blame each other. Let's just all figure out, you know, we have to take responsibility, whoever we are, wherever we are, and try to get all this stuff fixed. Next. And there is a constant thing saying, well, Orlando's polluting us. But if you look at the concentration of phosphorus coming out of Lake Kissimmee uh, a couple years ago, one year ago, um, it was only 75 parts per billion when it came out of Lake Kissimmee. And when it went into the lake, it was 425. So clearly a whole lot of phosphorus was added south of Lake Kissimmee. Now, 425 is a really weird year. Usually it's only about 200 parts per billion phosphorus. But just, just know that most of the nutrients coming into Okeechobee are coming from around the rim and not from the far away places. But we need to protect the upper chain lakes too from pollution. Next. And so um, I don't need to tell most people this, but when you get, you know, really nutrient rich, you get these, these algal scums and they're just, they're terrible and nobody likes them. Um, and, you know, for, for a state that, that has so much um, tourism, uh, next. Um, you know, these are signs on boat ramps. This, the one on the left is in the St. Lucie. The one on the right is, is in the Caloosahatchee. And they're at boat ramps and they're saying, don't touch the water, it can harm, harm you. Um, and you know, there's no chamber of commerce in the United States would ever want signs like this in their boat ramps and certainly not Florida. So, you know, and again, I wanna tell everybody, please keep coming to Florida. This doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen sometimes. And, and we're, we need to make it so it happens virtually never, but, but we're not there yet. So. And again, this is everybody wants this fixed. So um, it, we have some unifying things down here that, that we just, 
let things go too long and now it's time to fix it. Next. And just one more migration um, uh, story. Blue crabs that spawn up in the Appalachian Coholo Bay, they, they migrate all the way to South Florida and they migrate back. And, and I don't have an example for the Caloosahatchee or the St. Lucie, but those are estuaries and those are where shrimp spawn and crabs and oysters and groupers and snappers and sharks and, and they come up into these, these brackish areas to spawn. And if we ruin those, we're ruining the spawn of like a trillion things that come out of these, these organisms and, and populate the Gulf of Mexico. So once again, you know, we have a responsibility not only to ourselves, but to really large ecosystems to, to take care of our resources. Next. And it's led to things like this, you know, um, the joke that the lake's a toilet and the estuaries are sewers and, you know, ha ha, that's, that's funny, but it, it kind of hurts my feelings too, because this lake and our resources deserve better. So next. Okay, so we have this lake that's got so much good stuff going on. How are we going to fix it? And look at that picture in the lower right. That's that I took just uh, this year. Um, that's eelgrass recovery after Irma. Um, the lake got low. And you notice once that stuff starts growing, it makes the water so clear, you can't tell that. That's all underwater. That's just, just incredible. Anyway, that's why I still go out in the lake. I love it. Okay, next. So what do we need to do? We need to store water outside the lake. And what this basically means is we need to build storage north, south, east, and west of the Lake Okeechobee. And when a big event comes, if we can catch a foot or two of water north of Okeechobee, um, when Irma comes in, then instead of it going up to 17 feet, it only goes to 15 feet. That's not near as bad or 16 feet as 17 feet. And we're going to build reservoirs um, in the St. Lucie and Caloosahatchee watersheds so that when storms come that they don't get so much a glug of water. We're going to build reservoirs south of Okeechobee um, in, in the Everglades agricultural area to protect the, the water conservation areas. And so we just need to build more water storage features around the state. And not only they're going to help buffer these big wet events, but when the drought starts, they're going to have water. And so we're going to have more places to go to try to meet the water needs of natural systems and of people. And that's, you know, it sounds so simple. It really is, uh, but, but it's expensive. And then if you catch that water, you can clean it. You know, you have it under your control and you can run it through filter marshes or something like that and make it clean before putting it wherever it goes. And then the other thing is if you catch it, you have time to, to convey it back to the Everglades where we want it and not do emergency dumps to the estuaries where once you do it, you, you've lost it and you no longer can do it. So the very first thing in, in getting this done is we need to get more storage capacity in our watershed. Next. And so here's uh, some schematics of, of the reservoirs on the east side of the lake and the west side. Um, both of these reservoirs are under construction. They're both unbelievably large projects. When you go out there, you just can't believe how big they are. But we're talking about, you know, trying to handle water over millions of acres. Next. And here's the north and south components. Um, we're going to try to build some stuff on the north side of the lake and, and build stuff, those, those reservoirs down in the bottom. Next. And to me, the single most important thing, this, the, the A1 reservoir or the A2 reservoir um, is the single most important. And we're trying to get this lined up and we've got a lot of cooperation. And, and this one kind of shares a thing in common with Okeechobee. It's right in the middle of the water management system. There's a whole lot of water going by. And, and if we don't get it into this reservoir, it could go to the coast and we lose it. Um, so this one we don't have under construction yet. We're trying to get the authorizations. And so we're all trying to get everybody to say, come on, let's build this thing um, and, and make it part of our water management infrastructure. So uh, lots of stuff to work on. Next. Okay, so uh, when Everglades Restoration went to Congress in 2000, uh, only one person voted against it. It was a senator from Oklahoma. And uh, this bird is photographed right near here in the Everglades. And it, if, for those of you who know your birds, it's a scissor tail flycatcher and it's a state bird of Oklahoma. And I felt like writing him a letter and saying, Senator, if you want your bird back, restore the Everglades. But I never did that. Um, that would be too snarky. But um, actually, he has since voted for Everglades Project. So again, we're all linked. Next. And north of Okeechobee, we have all these beautiful landscapes. And so building great big reservoirs has some conflicts. And so we have other options up there. Next. 
This is the Kissimmee River channel when we drain the river. Next. We're filling the channel in right now as we speak. We're almost done with this project, the core and the, the water management district. Next. This is that same, you can see the channel running from the lower left of the, the photo up until the top and it's filled in. And so you think about this water, this is an ecological restoration project. We wanted to restore this beautiful floodplain, but this water is not moving really quickly to Lake Okeechobee, it's moving slowly. And it's getting filtered by the marshes and it's creating habitat. And so here's a natural fix. We're just trying to restore the, the wet landscapes of Florida, but it's also helping us with our water management challenges. Next. And this is, uh, if you build it, they will come. Next. And when we raise the Kissimmee lakes up, we're gonna make Lake Kissimmee a foot and a half deeper. And all those hatched areas around it are marshes that we drained because we lowered the lake. And so those are all gonna be reflooded. And again, it's gonna be storing water. And when, when we have a big Irma, instead of Lake Kissimmee going down right away, remember it went up to 54 feet, we're gonna leave it at 54 feet in the future. We're not gonna drain all that water out by the end of October. And it's gonna make our, our water management future better. And again, this project, we hope to finish it. I think they wanna finish construction this year and then they're gonna to try to start testing their water management procedures. But this is, and the fun thing for me is that river restoration is only four miles from my house. So I can see this stuff happening. It reminds me, we can do this. It just takes a long time. Next. And here's a working cattle ranch. Most of the watershed is cattle. Most people are surprised by that, but it still has embedded wetlands and you can see it has uh, something of interest to the, the egrets. And so if we're gonna spend money to put water in reservoirs, can we also enlist private landowners and say, can we pay you to help us store water? Can you plug your ditches? And next. And so here's an area where we went into uh, agricultural landscape and we plugged the ditches and this water after the storm is not glugging to the estuary or to the lake, it's just sitting there. And it's getting cleaned and it's, it's recharging aquifers and, and it's creating habitat. And it also is good for corridors. And a lot of these, if, if you pay people to do it, the land stays on the tax roll, they still have cattle out there. So um, there's a lot of opportunities up for us up north. Next. And this is the way we used to do agriculture. You just plow everything under and cities. Next. This is a modern grove where they, they left the big wetland and they left some of the prairie around it and we can still grow a lot of food per acre uh, as we need for people, but we also retain natural values and corridor and wildlife habitat. And so, you know, this, this other way to look at the landscape, I think is gonna really benefit us if we can stick with it. Next. And even these little short hydro period wetlands, you know, remember these birds are tanking up and um, this will last for three weeks and for some reason birds just get in there so there must be something to eat and even if it only lasts three weeks it's providing a gas station for migratory and, and resident birds. Next. So I'm going to wrap it up with one last thought. Um, that red circle is the, the northern Everglades down to the Everglades and you can see Okeechobee with the cities around it. Um, there's a lot of room for water projects there. There aren't a whole lot of people there yet. And so we have a lot of opportunity to protect these, these water management infrastructures in, in Central Florida. Next. And I'm sorry for this graphic, but this is the, the, the Everglades proper with all its channels and all those little X's and things. Those are projects that, that we're also gonna do. We're gonna fill some canals in. We're gonna, like the Tamiami Trail, the road blocks the water flow because it's kind of a dam and we built mile long bridges on it um, to let the water flow under it so we can start flowing water back south. And there's something really important about that because on the right side of this map is where Fort Lauderdale is and Miami. And next, this is a schematic of the Biscayne Aquifer. And there's, there's the Biscayne Bay is on the right, the Everglades is on the left. I put a little thing of Miami there on, on the, the ridge and they get their drinking water from the Biscayne Aquifer and it comes from the Everglades. And so you can see all that saltwater intrusion that comes in from the ocean and sea water is rising. And that red bar there is, is where their, their water wells are to supply water for one third of all Floridians. And so when we say we're gonna to try to quit wasting water to the Everglades and send it, wasting water to the estuaries and send it back to the Everglades where it's needed, even if you don't care about birds and fish, this is the future of drinking water for South Florida. I mean, this is really important that we put our water where our aquifers are and try to protect them. 
So, you know, it's just, it turns out to be one of those things, if it's good for birds, in this case, it's really good for people too. So, and with that, I will go to our final slide. <laughs> I think I took up all the time. I'm sorry, folks, but um, I'll be happy to answer any questions we have time for. Great, so the first one is, what can someone as an individual do to help Lake O? Join Audubon. <laughs> um, yeah, um, join, join environmental groups and, and learn what they're working on. And they'll send you information about it. You can donate to them. You know, our work, we're, we're a nonprofit. We need uh, people to give us money to help us continue what we do. And, you know, we're, we're all lobbyists for, for these projects. And we're trying to, you know, keep everybody together. And, you know, even when we're in a drought and I'm fighting with the farmers over who gets the water, they agree with me. Neither one of us wants the lake to be down at 10 feet. And, and they, when we go to, to Congress and say we need money, we're, we're together. And even though that daily thing, but until we can fix this, that's, that's what the world we live in. So, so support some uh, environmental group who's trying to work on this and, and they'll keep you posted and, and we can keep the word going to all of our um, decision makers. You have to help us get this done. So Paul, how is climate change affecting your plans for the lake? For Okeechobee, it's actually not affecting us a whole lot. Um, the climate on the peninsula hasn't changed on the interior too much. Um, it's having big changes down on the coast because sea level's going up. It's gone up like a foot in the last several decades. And that's going to start making migrations of people toward the interior. And so that's kind of our, our most immediate threat. There are some predictions that the weather's going to get more volatile, which again, we better build these features so we can handle more volatile weather if, if that's where we're headed. Great, we're gonna take a few more. So why do we care about submerged aquatic vegetation in the lake? What is the, the real value of aquatic vegetation for the big picture? Um, it's where the bass live and that's a huge fishery, but it's also, um, that's the vegetation zone that can come or go. One third of Lake Okeechobee can be vegetated at any given time, but one third of that is, is the SAV and that stuff can completely disappear. After Irma, it went from 29,000 acres down to 5,000. We like to have 40,000. So, and it also cleans the water. It protects the rest of the marsh from the dirty middle. So it's, it's just like this key in the middle type plant zone that really does a lot of things. It cleans water, it protects the marsh from dirty water. It's where all the fishing goes on um, and it's really pretty. So you talked about the snail kite, but um, why is the snail kite so important? And maybe you can touch on the status of the invasive apple snails. Okay, so there's a snail kite in this picture about to pick up a snail. Um, it's kind of a Goldilocks species. It, it eats the Florida apple snail. That's all it eats is apple snails. Um, very, very picky bird. You can see those long talons um, to pick up these round snails. Uh, and, and the snails, if you keep the habitat flooded all the time, they disappear. If you dry it out too long, they disappear. They have to have it fluctuating. And Florida's wet and dry seasons used to do that naturally for them. Um, but with all of our human perturbations in hydrology, th th they've had a hard time keeping up. And so as apple snails go, kites go, and it's telling us how close we were coming to what supposedly is a natural hydrology. So they're a really good indicator of, are you getting the water right? Um, right now, the, the native snails have invaded most of the state. We're still trying to study their impacts. Um, and they actually are supporting snail kites right now, not the native snails, but we hope to get back to having better native snails as we get this stuff under better control. We're a little bit over, but we're gonna take questions for a few more minutes. So Paul, this question has a lot of terminology in it. So hopefully in your answer, you can explain what some of these terms mean. But as cyanobacteria is a component, a component of paraphyton, are we seeing an influx of harmful types? Um, yeah, the cyanobacteria and paraphyton are not the bad guys. Um, not all cyanobacteria uh, create toxins, and it's really the ones out in the middle of the lake and the water column that, that are the toxin formers, and they're doing it because they don't want to get eaten by zooplankton. Um, so this, there's a whole lot of cyanobacteria types, and only a few of them are bad characters, and most of those are in the water column out in the middle of the lake. Question about burning. Isn't burning the marsh vegetation good for the lake? Why don't we do more of that? Yeah, that's a good question. And actually we do, um, 
we're doing much more of it and the agency is actually very engaged in it. There was a pause for a while because we had one fire that created such a plume that it turned on street lights over in Stewart, which is like 35 miles away because <laughs> the smoke and people complained and then the agencies are afraid to light the fire. But if what happened in 2007 and eight is, is some air boaters went out and lit fires and they didn't do it in good fire weather. And so it burned and we had these, the smog every night for like two weeks and it was just a mess. And so burning is dangerous, but not burning is even more dangerous. And our agencies have actually come together and they're doing great right now. And I just, I can't thank them enough for, for taking this because it's hard, but we have to do it. Another question about snail kites. Um, this person wrote, it's my understanding that snail kites have adapted to eat other species of snails. We have a high concentration of them now in Payne's Prairie. Can you comment? Yes, so these are the exotic apple snails. Um, they're from South America. We think they were brought here because they're kind of interesting aquarium uh, things. Um, they're much more resistant to uh, water level problems. They can survive in the mud for a whole year where our snails only last about four months. Um, and they have spread very aggressively across Florida. Now they're up at Payne's Prairie and the kites have followed them. Um, and again, we're just kind of watching how they spread and how the kites respond. But the kites, you know, the good thing is they can live off them, but the bad thing is we don't really know the impacts those snails are having on the rest of the ecosystem. Great, and um, I wanna ask you one more, and this is a good one. So why are we trying to manage nature? Doesn't history suggest that nature left to its own devices will recover on its own or not? Um, it's too late. <laughs> we like, you know, the, the everybody's agricultural area, it used to be, it's, it's organic soils and they've been subsiding because they're, they're peat. And so when we first built the Hoover Dyke, they were probably in an elevation about 18 feet or something. Now they're down to about 10 feet. So if we took the dike out, you know, remember that 12 to 15 stage envelope we'd like to keep like, if we took the dike out, it dropped to 10 feet. And so we've already done so much impact that we can't go back to what it was. Um, but, but when I was talking about what we do in the northern watershed, of uh, restoring wetlands and stuff, we can do that. That's, that's our primary goals. Do as much of that as you can and then find out what problems remain and then do the other kind of big box things. Um, but, but as much as we can, we want to do natural system restoration and give Mother Nature a chance to just function like she needs to and us butt out. Great. So that is all we have time for right now. Thank you guys so, so, so much for joining us and Dr. Gray as we talk about Lake Okeechobee. His email and his Twitter handle are up on the screen. And so if you have burning questions, just let us know and we'll do our best to get back to you. Just as a reminder, everyone who registered for this webinar will receive the presentation, uh, the recorded presentation. So if you miss something, you want to go back, you want to jot down some notes, don't worry, you'll have the opportunity. The video we will also be on uh, National Audubon Society's Facebook page under the video tab, and we will be uploading it to our education resources page at Audubon Florida. You can find that at fl.audubon.org. And thank you again for, for ending your work week with us. Uh, happy, happy Friday, happy weekend. Thank you, Dr. Gray, and thank you, everyone. And sorry I talked so long, there weren't question time, but anyway. <laughs> Don't worry, they will, we will find a way to, to make you available. Okay. So thank you everybody so much and, and have a great night. Bye folks. <laughs>